Sidaji Sauta Jaya Lita Jeki Sem ela não há paz, não há beleza É só tristeza e a melancolia Que não sai de mim, não sai de mim, não sai Mas se ela voltar, se ela voltar Que coisa linda, que coisa louca Menos peixinhos a nadar no mar Do que os beijinhos que eu darei na sua boca Dentro dos meus braços Os abraços são de cem milhões de abraços Apertado assim, colado assim, calado assim Abraços e beijinhos e carinho sem ter fim Que é pra acabar com esse negócio de viver longe de mim Não quero mais esse negócio de você viver assim Vamos deixar desse negócio de você viver sem mim Não quero mais esse negócio de viver Hi everybody, welcome! We're so glad that you're able to join us tonight. Um, just before we get started, I wanted to go ahead and go over a few housekeeping things. Um, just make sure you keep your mic muted um, throughout the presentations. And if you have a question, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A feature down at the bottom. You should see it next to the chat feature. Um, and also we invite you to turn on your cameras so that you can join us and so we can see your lovely faces. Um, and I'd just like to welcome you to our pizza and politics event. Uh, we're so excited to talk to you guys about politics, um, the different layers of politics and voting, um, considering it is an election year. So my name is Trinity. I'm the student government vice president at the Point Siena campus. Um, and with us, we also have a few of our um, student government members here. So I'd actually like to allow some of them to introduce themselves very quickly. I'm going to start with Beyonce, who is going to be co-facilitating this event with me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Beyonce. I am the vice president of SGA at the West Campus. And yet again, so happy to be here for the Peace and Politics event. And I'll pass it on to the next. Stephania. Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Salerno and I'm the SGU president for the Osceola campus and I'll be um, helping our moderators with the chat. Feel free to ask any questions. And then we have Angel. Uh, hi, my name is Angel Moranta. I'm the SGA president for the Lake Lona campus and I'll be monitoring the attendees. Ah. And then I believe we have Vivian. Vivian present. Okay, well, we'll come back to Vivian. Um, and then if, am I missing anybody else from student government that would like to introduce themselves? Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm the administrative officer at the Osceola campus and I will be monitoring the chat. So feel free to ask any questions and comment anything and I'll look it over. Okay. And also with us, we have two of our um, fabulous professors, uh, our very own from Valencia. They're political science professors. So I'd like to allow them to say hi to you guys. They will be sharing their expertise and knowledge with us today. Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Heather Ramsire, and I teach political science courses at the Point Siena campus. Hi, I'm Professor Adrian Matthews, and I teach political science courses on the West Campus and in our new Zoom world this year. Yes, we love Zoom world. <laughs> okay, and we're actually going to go ahead and um, start off with the poll. So I'm going to pass the time over to B so she can get that started. All right, and for the first poll question, and we're just going to ask a simple uh, question, have you voted yet? Give you a little time to answer.
Okay, does anyone need a little bit more time to answer? Um, it says, it just said that it will allow her to click on an option. And if it doesn't end up working, you can always tell us in the chat if you did or not. Yes. I think that's the best second option. All right. All right, now is time. Okay. Go ahead, B. All right, I'll just point out um, one of the answers. I voted by mail, but dropped it off at the DMV. Okay. All right, now I'll give it over to Trinity for the first three guided questions for the professors. Um, I first wanted to ask real quick, is it possible for us to see those results for the poll? Or is it not possible? We closed it? Okay. I, I have the results if you'd like them. Um, I think that's okay. Um, I just wanted to see like who was uh, voting and who was not, but that's okay. No problem. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, as a seat member, um, when they come to me and they tell, or I ask them if they're voting, they tell me they're not voting. Um, one of the popular answers that they give me when I ask why not is, well, my vote doesn't really matter or it's not gonna make a difference because it's just one vote. So, um, you know, I think as a seat member and to you professors as well, I'm sure you know that that's definitely just not true. Um, so my first question to you is why do individual votes matter and is specifically student votes? And I think I'll start answering that question there. And if you can bring up slide three with the statistics on it of who turns out to vote, thank you. If you look at the screen here, you'll see a breakdown of who voted in 2016 in the presidential election. And I invite you all on the call to make some observations, maybe share those in the chat Keep in mind, if you click on the chat, you want to make sure that you click the drop down to speak to panelists. I, th I think it speak to everybody in the chat, and that way we can all see your answers. But this is, um, sorry, it's a drop down, and you can do to all panelists and attendees, and that way we'll be able to engage in a conversation together about this. But if you look at the slide here, and obviously it's missing a lot of groups, but the first category is age. What percentage of the voting eligible public turned out to vote from that particular category in 2016? And so what we're looking at here is from 18 to 29 year olds, 46% turned out to vote in 2016. And when you look at 65 years old plus, so people over 65, 71% of that category turned out to vote. Now, what I always like for students to think about is, are your policy concerns the same as someone who is over 65? There's, there's going to be some overlap, but I'm gonna guess that you guys are probably concerned about things like jobs in the future, college loans, um, the, whether or not you have to pay for college a number of things that are going to affect your age group that the 65 plus year olds might be more focused on their pensions and on their health care, right? So this is why I think it's so important for young people to vote. They're currently not well represented because their, their voices aren't being heard in these elections. Look at some of the other groups. If you look at race and ethnicity, the highest voter turnout is among white voters. And then we see black voters are at 59%, Hispanic 48, Asian at 49. So low voter turnout doesn't just happen in uh, to all groups the same way. It happens to different groups in different ways. And so since our voting preferences are slightly adjusted based on our group demographics, that affects who wins and what types of laws are passed. 
If you want to go to the next slide, please, it'll show how the vote broke down for the candidates in 2016. And this is a CNN exit poll. So it, it tells us the people who voted and, and what their voter preferences were. And I invite you in the chat to maybe just make some observations of what you see here. And you'll notice that this is broken down into categories. They're, they're breaking this down by race and, um, sorry, gender and race ethnicity. And then what percentage of that group voted for Clinton? What percentage of that group voted for Trump? And what percentage had no answer? But what are some observations that maybe you can make in the, in, with these data? I'm not seeing anything come in yet, but I'll go ahead and just go ahead and type that if you do have something there. The, if, if you look at how okay, most voted for Clinton, good, that's an excellent observation. Most of the group groups here, demographic groups, they did support Clinton, correct? And you see that most of the, the both categories of white voters a majority, not all, of course, but a majority supported Trump, right? So I see another thing, if, if more people from the non-white groups would have voted, it could have drastically changed the results. Yes, um, you. this is why it makes a difference of who votes. And so looking at how the vote breaks down by these different demographic categories, I think can help reinforce why it's important that we have a diverse range of individuals, and that includes age, race, ethnicity, turn out to vote in the 2020 election. So if we can go to the next slide, circling back to Trinity's question, you know, why should someone vote? Does one vote really make a difference? It absolutely does. For many of you probably on this um, Zoom session, the 2000 election might be, okay, I wasn't even born yet. Mm -hmm. For some of us, we were alive for that fun, I say sarcastically. Um, here in Florida, all eyes were on us in the nation because of issues we had with our ballots, how those ballots were counted. Um, it ended up the whole entire election hinged on not just the state of Florida, just one single county. If you look in the bottom corner of that slide, the left corner, you'll see that at that time, our state had 25 electoral votes. And you'll see how close the election was. In the yellow circle up in the top corner, 537 votes separated George W. Bush from Al Gore for becoming the president of the United States. Um, and so thinking about just that single county, thinking about 537 people in our state that if they would have not waited to vote, if they would have gone and early voted, um, whatever the hurdle was that they were putting in their way, if they were an eligible voter, if they had gone and voted, I think about 537 people and we can easily just think about one of our campuses on an average Monday morning when we're on campus. And those 537 people would be flooding into a parking lot. Um, and so 537 is a very minimal number. And so that's why every vote really does count. Um, next slide, please. I know that in my um, government class, my students right now are working on um, an activity related to public opinion and political socialization. And one of the things I've asked them is, you know, do they think their vote matters? And many of them say, no, it's just one. But that's the idea, you know, one drop of water in the bucket is what's filling at a time is what's filling the bucket. So 537 votes, and that was for the presidential election in 2000. But some recent data, this is from the uh, 2018, if you um, notice in these boxes, it tells you from the November 6, 2018 elections. And these were for the Florida Florida House of Representatives. So these are individuals that are actually making decisions about your tuition rate. They are directly connected to your personal life on a daily basis. And in the top box, you'll notice the difference between the votes uh, between these two candidates was 61 voters. And in the bottom, 33 voters. That's a, that is a literal classroom at Valencia when we're face-to-face -face, uh, or even in our online situations for the most part. So one vote really does matter. Um, one person deciding to fill in their ballot completely, not just fill in for president, but fill in for things like their Florida representative, those really do, those votes, each one of them matters. 
We have a question from Eliza asking, why if so many people voted for Clinton, did Trump win? We're actually gonna be yeah. in a moment. <laughs> um, it, yeah, Julian, can you go back to the slide, slide number four, please, with the exit poll data? Thank you, and it, it, it's a great question. And we are gonna answer this a little bit more too when we talk about the Electoral College. But if you're looking at this table and you see where it says uh, there's a percentage underneath white men, white women, that's the percentage of the electorate that they made up. Okay, so when you're looking at this, um, what is this? 71% of the electorate were white individuals and a majority of white individuals voted for Trump. Um, now, I think I saw in the chat, Miranda had said if more people in the category of black voters, category of Latino voters, had the numbers been higher, then the results might have been different. And when we looked at, and, and that's not to say, you know, it's up to a particular group to be able to turn out and vote, but it is showing that when that that high voter turnout means you make up a larger part, portion of the electorate. And even though more people might have been interested in a different candidate, because they made up more of the electorate, that person can end up winning. Now, why Hillary Clinton got more votes and Donald Trump ended up winning, that's another question that we'll um, discuss when we get to the Electoral College. But I hope that helps clarify just a little bit. And that, that's the idea of why we wanna see more um, voter turnout from all groups. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, like these numbers are out outrageous like that is crazy one vote definitely does matter for sure um so thank you for that my next question is actually in reference to the various roles that political parties play in major elections so what can you tell us about that I, i'm sure a lot of the students on the call probably um, are not registered with a political party you know I, I bet a lot of you guys because we know this from the data that that younger people are voting or registering as no party affiliation or as independents, right? But we still have these big two political parties that seem to dominate everything. And I like to point out that they do serve a function as frustrating as, as they can be. They, they do serve some valuable um, services in a well-functioning democracy. Having a group of like-minded individuals being able to organize as a political party helps those individuals who are out of power be able to contest power, right? Think about it if we did not have political parties, if, if we weren't able to identify with people in other states, even in other cities, to kind of know how they wanted to vote, that would make it very difficult for us to take collective action. So political parties are a, a cornerstone of democracy. Now, how they have been used recently, the way that people become much more loyal to their political party than they do to the nation, the way they misrepresent the other political party from time to time, these are some of the downsides of political parties, but it's important to know that they do play some, some functional roles. One of the big ones here is, is they provide what we call a voting cue or kind of like a hint when you're going to vote. And if you look at the ballot, the, the ballot's four pages long in Florida. It's two pages front and back, at least um, the Orange County ballots are. And it, it can be hard to know who's running for these other offices and how to make informed decisions. We're all busy, we have jobs. I, I teach this for a living and I still couldn't tell you who all the candidates are and what all the positions are, right? But I can look and I can see which party they're affiliated with. And it gives me a little bit of a shortcut to say, okay, th this is what this person stands for or what they're affiliated with. It's not perfect, but it is a little bit of a cue. Um, one, two other things that I, I wanted to say about that is if you wanna run for office, being with a political party can help you organize. I don't have enough friends and family to help me win an election if I wanted to run. So I would be better off jumping under the umbrella of one of the two big political parties because there's already organized efforts to, to help those candidates win office. The other big thing with political parties is um, they decide the rules of the elections. They decide who gets to be on the stages for the debates. 
they get to decide how the lines are going to be drawn for your different congressional districts in the state of Florida. So they have a, a, a lot of clout in terms of being able to if, make the rules fit their needs. And um, is there any like resources that students can check out um, if they want to research more about this? Absolutely, um, next slide please. Um, one of the things that the librarians at Valencia have done, if you're not already familiar with this, they have created a lib guide that you and even your friends and family that are not Valencia students, they can access this lib guide and we'll be sharing it with you later. Um, we got a little screenshot here, but within this lib guide, you can find out about the candidates um, from non-biased uh, resources. And then also, if you're interested in learning more about other things that are on the ballot, um, in each county, there might be initiatives. And then there's also statewide initiatives that will alter our state constitution. Uh, and so if you're wanting to learn more about the candidates or those issues, you can definitely go to the lib guide. The lib guide is now in the chat box too, in case you want to reference it. Thank you for that. Yes, definitely check out the lib guide. I actually looked at it myself and it was super, super helpful. I thought I knew a lot about voting. That really told me that I didn't know enough. <laughs> so now I'm more educated. Okay, so my next question is, um, so it's really important for all for us to also be aware of down ballot races, um, apart from just the presidential candidates and presidential races. So why are down ballot races just as important as presidential races? Go ahead and go on to the next slide. Perfect. Um, so one of the things is that we obviously focus, especially in a year like this, we're focusing on the president and we're focusing on those federal races. We're focusing on in the Senate, there will be candidates elected. Now in the state of Florida, Marco Rubio and Rick Scott are, are not up for election. That will actually happen in two years. So stay tuned for that. Um, but in other states, this will be occurring. And this is important because right now the Senate is controlled by the Republicans. So we'll be watching those races to see if the Republicans retain control or if it tips to the Democrats. And then for all of us nationwide, we're electing our representatives for the House of Representatives serving us in Washington, DC. So on this slide, you obviously see the presidential candidates uh, for the two major parties, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Um, in the red suit, that is Val Demings. She represents my district and Professor Matthew's district uh, in Orange County, uh, and she is a Democrat. In the bottom picture, if you can't tell that's Darren Soto, well, he's got a big bunch of signs behind him. Uh, he actually represents a portion of um, Southern Orange and into Osceola County, and exactly where our uh, Osceola and Point Siena campuses are located. Um, and so those are federal offices that are up for election. But again, there's all these other things on the ballot that follow and what are they? And so Professor Matthews, I'll turn this over to you. Great, yes, as we said, this is a, a four page ballot. So there are a lot of offices and what we call down ballot races. Now, one thing I wanna say with the federal election, and, and this is a, um, picture of the first page of the ballot in, in Orange County. Each county does their elections differently. They have their own ballot design. So your ballot, if you're not in Orange County, may look different, but you can access your ballot on your county supervisor of elections website to see exactly what it will look like before you go into the elect and before you go into the voting booth. The you'll notice at the very top of the ticket is the president and vice president, right? And one thing that happens in these presidential years is the popularity of the candidates at the top of the ticket can have a big impact on who wins on these down ballot races, right? So in other words, if there's a lot of enthusiasm for Donald Trump, then there will probably be a good Republican turnout and that will help Republican, Republican candidates down ballot. And if you look here at some of these races, um, the representative in Congress, as we said, Val Demings is, is running and then she's um, running against a Republican that I haven't heard of. Um, Val Demings is pretty much in a, a safe, safe seat and, and almost certain to win re-election. 
but the challenger is listed first. The way the ballots are created in the state of Florida is whichever party holds the office of governor, then that party gets listed first on the ballot. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but it actually is. There is research that shows that that can give a one to two percentage point advantage to the candidate that is listed first. So it's interesting that Val Demings holds the office, but she's listed on the bottom. When I said that the parties get to make up the rules, that is something that they decided in the state legislature in Florida that that's how our ballot will be designed. Now, there are a lot of offices here. I've highlighted some of the more um, prominent ones. You can see how some include a party affiliation. And I was saying before that you can you can know a little bit about your vote by being able to select the party, but not all do. Some of these, like if the ones where we're confirming, and this is a justice of the Florida Supreme Court, not the US Supreme Court, but we have to confirm these justices, there's not going to be a party queue for these. So you would need to look these up yourself. But I do want you to just take a minute and look on your own ballot at these different offices, and you can look at it for whichever party you're registered for, for who they recommend as well. Um, one last thing I want to say about these down ballot races is I showed the, the turnout for presidential years. That's usually around 60% on average for the entire population. When it's not a presidential year, it's much lower. In two years, when we go to elect our governor, it'll be around 40%. So we elect the governor and we'll elect members to the House. And as Professor Ramsar said, we'll elect, um, I think it's Marco Rubio's seat that'll be up in 2022. When we go out for municipal and county elections, it might be six to 10% that actually turn out to vote. The next time we vote for the mayor in Orlando, it'll be in November of 2021. There's not gonna be a big race at the top. So that contributes to people not really being aware or not enthusiastic about going out and voting. But it is important to remember that elections happen more than every four years. This is just kind of the world cup of elections. Think of it that way when the presidential um, presidential candidates are on the ticket. Thank you for that response. Um, another question that I have, um, first of all, many individuals find the Electoral College to be um, somewhat of a complex subject. So Professor Matthews, can you explain the Electoral College and how it affects the presidential elections? I can explain the basics and maybe dispel some myths, right? Um, we often hear that it doesn't matter who you vote for because the Electoral College can vote for someone else anyway. And many of you know that Hillary Clinton did win more votes in 2016, about 3 million more votes than Donald Trump did, but he still won the presidency. And the thing about the Electoral College is it did not override those voters that voted for Clinton. It just simply represents individual states. So if you look on this slide, there are a couple key points to, to know about the Electoral College. We tend to think of ourselves as Americans voting in an American election, but this is a Florida election. It's state centered when you're voting for the president. So what's going to happen is we're going to have this election in Florida and there are going to be 49 other presidential elections happening in other states. Whoever wins the presidential election in Florida, whether it's Biden or Trump, they're going to get all of Florida's 29 electoral college votes. It's winner takes all. So your vote matters. And I can't stress this enough. You live in one of the most important states and in one of the most important regions for your vote. This is the swing swingiest region of the swingiest state. So it is very important that you turn out and vote this November. If you look at the map here, you'll see that some states are different shades of blue, some are different shades of red, and then there are um, five, six uh, that are brown. And the brown are the swing states or the toss up states. Does that mean we already know what happened in all of these other states? Not, not at all. People are still voting. We aren't even to election day. It's just based on voter registration. We'll assume some states are pretty safe. For example, California has not voted for Republicans since um, 1988, I, I think it was last, or maybe 1984. They always vote Democratic. It's a pretty safe state. 
Florida has gone back and forth. Florida voted for Bill Clinton, then it voted for George W. Bush, then it voted for Barack Obama in the last two elections, and then it voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And it's always incredibly co close. As Professor Ramsar showed, it came down to a matter of 600 votes in that one state. Now, what you have to do as a presidential candidate is collect enough of these states to get you to 270 electoral college votes. That's a majority of the electoral college votes that are up for grabs. I pulled this image this morning. There's a website, it's called 270 to win. And there are a lot of websites out there that kind of do these projections of, of how the vote might fall down. Um, fall down is probably an appropriate word for it. But if you look here uh, at this morning, this is the, these are the projections that they had as of today. So we're down to about five swing states and um, a, a lot of the other states they believe are, are pretty much leaning in favor of one candidate or the other. This is also why you're getting so many phone calls, why you see so many ads. My husband has not yet voted. I voted early, but my husband hasn't voted. I got a text yesterday saying, we noticed Jonathan who lives in your house hasn't voted, can you remind him to vote? So you are gonna be hounded up until election day if you have not voted and beware of other people in your house if, if they haven't voted. I shouldn't have told you my husband hasn't voted. I'm trying to tell the students to vote early but I can't even convince my husband to do it. So hopefully you guys take my advice better than he does. Um, I, I, think I, I think I got that I, is a little bit, and let me, let me say one last thing on the Electoral College. The um, reason Clinton won in 2016, why she won the popular vote and Trump won the Electoral College was because Donald Trump was able to win some key states by a very small margin, right? So just kind of eked past his, his competitor, Clinton, in states like Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan. But what happened in, with Clinton is in the states she won, like New York and California, where there are lots of people, she won by landslides. So when they add up all the votes that she won nationwide, it comes out to a greater total than what Donald Trump had. The problem was it wasn't spread across enough states. It's kind of like writing a paper really, really, really well that only counts for 20% of your grade, right? And then you still got the other 80%. So you got to spread out your time and your talent on all the assessments so that you can pass all of them. So going back to those electors, if we can go to the next slide. Professor Matthews was talking about all the, like we're getting visits, both candidates, uh, former President Obama has been here, the vice presidential candidates, it's on a, if you're not noticing, you might not follow regular news of what happens in our community but we are having visits um, consistently from the candidates, the vice presidential candidates, and even um, former presidents uh, that are kind of, we, we call it, you know, trumping for them ironically, but you know, they're out campaigning for those individuals. So these electors that uh, Professor Matthews was alluding to, they are real people like you and I. You see a picture, this is uh, the top left picture. This is in um, the state capitol. And this is the electors. You'll notice if you can look closely, they all have blue badges on the blue, uh, identified with the Democrats. So this was back during President Obama's uh, re-election campaign in 2012 that this group picture was taken. And over on the right, you see them all signing. If we go to the next slide, um, this is the, uh, for example, in the last election, um, this gentleman is the Republican chairman, as you can see from Palm Beach County. And he's showing his credentials to be able to be present and vote uh, his single vote, but he's representing a group of voters. And on the next slide, going into what they are signing is this is back from that 2000 election when Florida was holding up the whole election process. All of those individual names, these are electors that have pledged to the Republican Party uh, to elect George Bush. And that's what this two page document says. And on the very bottom, we can see Catherine Harris, um, who was the Secretary of State in at our time, at that time, Jeb Bush was our governor. And it's got even the state of Florida that's been embossed. So who are these people for this year? If we go to the next slide, these are the actual lists. Like depending on what happens, when we count after November the 3rd, when we start counting all these ballots in the state of Florida, um, on the left side, um, that two column document, that is the Democratic Party. And if you actually look at that list, you may, if you follow politics at all, if you follow government, 
Um, you'll see Nikki Freed. She's our Secretary um, of Agriculture. You'll see Gwen Graham. She was a candidate previously for Florida governor and her father is Senator and governor, was Senator and Governor Bob Graham. Bill Nelson in the second column, he's a former Senator that represented Florida. They are all Democrats. So these are people that are very high and tight within the Democratic Party. The other document that's a single column, these are all Republicans that if Donald Trump is reelected, um, that these are individuals that have pledged their votes. And again, if we were to skim down through that, we'd start popping up names that, oh, I, I recognize that name. There's somebody that's pretty prominent um, within the uh, Republican Party. Um, next slide. So again, they're real people, these electors. You might think that they're a group that doesn't care about us. They actually do, because they are connected with the parties that the two candidates um, end up, whoever wins that popular vote, whoever will win those votes, that's who they're affiliated with. And there's a direct connection there. And Professor Matthews is typing in the chat box. Is there on the Democratic list, you might notice that there's a Frank Biden there. Frank Biden is uh, Joe Biden's younger brother, he happens to live here in Florida. He is one of the Democratic electors. So he's the third one down on the list because it's listed alphabetically. And she's pointing out too in the chat, if you're not reading it, we, she and I were texting last night, Hillary Clinton in the state of New York is the Democratic uh, elector in the state of New York. I, I think it's, you know, it's so relevant because it's, can these electors not vote the way they're instructed to? Possibly, right? That you know, this is kind of an unanswered question, and they do vote in a different way sometimes, but it's never affected an outcome of the election. But you know, Joe Biden's brother—he's not. If, if Joe Biden wins Florida, Joe Biden's brother is not going in and saying, "You know what? I really don't like my brother. I'm voting for Donald Trump this election." Right? The the system works pretty well. The the individuals they pick are are committed to voting for those individuals. All right, and we'll go on to the next question, more about the ballot. What issues and amendments are on the ballot and why is it important that we research each amendment before voting on them? When it comes to the ballot initiatives that you're seeing, these are opportunities that we have been given. Some of these are at the county level and others are at the state level to make changes uh, either to our state governing documents like the constitution or to our county charter. And it's important we recognize that we have this direct connection to democracy. Rather than me just electing someone, one of those other names I'll bubble in, that they're gonna make a decision for me, I get to make this decision. And so we have a direct connection through this vote. And so we need to understand what the actual wording in these initiatives means. And this is where that LibGuide can come in very handy. If we go to the next slide, So on this slide, what we're seeing is Amendment 1 and Amendment 2. And they, I'm a geek, I have my sample ballot right here. Um, and so Amendment 1 and Amendment 2, you can look up and read more about these. In some cases, like Amendment 1, we're just changing wording. In our state constitution, it already um, infers in positive language that we allow people to vote that are 18 and US citizens. Uh, this is changing it from positive, like we allow you, it's gonna change it to something that's more of a negative wording that you are only permitted, right? Something that sounds more restrictive, but it's a simple change. So you can read more about that, decide whether you want to vote yes or no. For all of these, we need to have 60% or higher. So this is not um, a simple majority. 60% of voters must approve these amendments to the state constitution to have them move forward. Um, amendment two is one that many of you, I'm sure, would be interested in. And this is raising our minimum wage um, over a yearly period uh, to $15 an hour. Uh, and then after that, it would be adjusted by inflation. And so if you go to the LibGuide, they'll explain via some other websites, you know, the pros and cons. Um, there's got to be always a downside. And so it'll explain what the downside to this might be if you were to vote yes for it. So you can make an informed decision. Next slide. And so on this one, um, this is a big one, Amendment 3. This is changing our primary election. And so this is something that goes back to what Professor Matthews was talking about earlier. The idea that the political parties um, have set up a structure right now where in the primaries, if any of you are eligible to vote, if you're an independent, you're not able to vote in the primary for any party related races. So if we're trying to narrow down the candidates for governor or for sheriff, 
you're not able to vote in those races. Um, what this would do is it would change to a structure called a top two primary. States like California already use this system. Um, and I encourage you to research it and make an informed decision about um, this initiative because it is one um, that would allow more voters to vote, but there are some potential consequences because of it. Amendment four, um, this is a big one because I just told you, you have the right to vote and make these decisions. What it would do is it would require us not to just vote once, but vote twice on these initiatives that you see on the ballot. So it would appear, for example, on the 2020 ballot, and then two years later, it would appear again, and it would have to get over 60%. Uh, and so I'm trying not to put my own input in here, but you have to think if you have the right right now to vote on these, we're gonna make it harder for you and I to make changes. So look at this and decide if you want to vote yes or no. And then the next slide, um, and this is the end of the amendments for this year. Sometimes it's multiple pages uh, beyond even the, the four pages that we see this year. Um, these two might be difficult depending on your situation to understand because um, for many of us, we're not maybe a homeowner yet. Um, it's something that we're exploring. Um, we might be renting right now, but when it comes to these last two amendments, they re relate to something called the homestead exemption. Uh, and this is where definitely doing research can be helpful. Even I myself, who happen to uh, have a home, I'm, you know, I have a home that I, I'm paying off on a mortgage, but I still needed to go and read the details about this so I could break it down and understand if this was advantageous um, for us to do as a state or if it was something that I should vote no on. So I encourage you to look at that. Can I add something on to what Professor Ramsar said about um, the amendment four? <laughs> I think she was re refraining from her personal <laughs> opinion there. Um, just to connect this to what we were talking about earlier, right? So amendment four says you've approved something. Now you got to come back out and approve it again, right? If we know that the voter turnout is the highest in a presidential year, and we know that it's different from other elections, right? We know that it's younger, it's more diverse than a midterm or a municipal election. It's not likely to be the same people to come back out and vote again 90 days later, right? And, and you know, I, as what Professor Ramsar said, if, if the people of our 60% of the people have already said yes, you know, that's a solid supermajority. You know, it's interesting that they want us to come back out a second time. So think about some of the things like the legalization of medical marijuana in the state of Florida. That was on the ballot and it was approved by more than 60% of the voters, but it was also approved when there was a high youth voter turnout as well. So would that have passed a second try with the voters if you had to come back out 90 days later? you know, you can't miss that there's an election happening this November, but in 90 days from now, sometimes with these municipal elections, I kind of forget that they were happening. And then I see the sign, and I'm like, what are we voting on today? So it's much less high profile than what a presidential election is going to be. Can we go back to that slide for just a minute, amendment three and four, just so... So again, that's what Professor Matthews was asking about at the bottom. And then there's also been a question asked about with amendment three, um, again, in our state for the primaries, we only allow individuals that are registered Democrat to narrow down the candidates for the Democratic presidential candidates. And we do the same thing for on the Republican side. And we do this for governors, sheriffs, all of that. So this um, would take us from having a closed election and it would allow independent voters. So if you're an independent voter, this would directly impact you. It would allow you to vote in the primary. And one of the things is when this was first proposed, the only two groups that were really against it were the Democrats and the Republicans, because this was going to um, take away their advantage in the elections because now you're going to have independent voters that some of you might vote one way for governor and another for state legislature. Now your vote's going to be able to be counted. Um, and so the Democrats and Republicans were both against this. Um, one of the things that's risen up and bubbled up, um, and I've tried to do research, because again, I mentioned in the state of California, they use this system. The big thing that's been put forward now by the League of Women Voters um, and that the Democrats and Republicans have really run with is that this will disenfranchise, it will keep 
voters that are minorities from being able to elect candidates that are similar in background to them. Um, and what I've been trying to research is in California, when they did this, did that happen? Um, and so I would encourage you to consider, um, you know, do you really think this will occur um, that will disenfranchise voters? Are we more likely to have candidates running that maybe have been less likely to run because they don't directly affiliate closely with the Democratic Party's platform or the Republican Party's platform? And again, Amendment 3 is actually focusing on our state primary, um, uh, state elections, excuse me, governor and our state legislature. It wouldn't impact presidential elections or Senate at the moment. That's a future initiative that's um, currently been petitioned and signed off on. So do your research. Okay, for the last question, if you can go over this quickly, because we are running behind on time. Um, it's as complex as it is, it says, how is the election different from others that we previously, previously experienced? So of course we have COVID. We are all experiencing it while we're sitting at home in a Zoom meeting instead of being on campus. So when we look at this uh, infographic that's here, one of the things to understand is each state, again, has established their own laws about mail-in ballots or absentee ballots. And so the section over on the left side, um, you'll notice that that's titled underneath that these are the mail-in ballots. They have to be received on or before November the 3rd. And you'll notice there's actually a green bubble over there, green circle with Florida. And um, so that's the idea that they're starting to count those ballots um, already, and they're doing that in the state of Florida. But you'll notice the dots change color. Um, and so the states, when do they actually start counting? Some of them start counting prior to election day, some of them before the polls close on election day. Over on the far right side, this is that the ballots can be received after November the 3rd, and each state has different laws. And you'll notice over on that side, on the far right side, you'll see California. Um, you'll see some other states that are big, um, Pennsylvania, which again has been a state that's been contested, Democrat and Republican, the state of New York, the state of Texas, going back to the comment that was made um, regarding uh, Texas now being a toss-up state. So one of the things about this election we need to recognize that for many of you, if you remember back to 2016 or 2012 or even 2008, we're used to sometime around midnight on election night, we know who our next president is going to be because of the large number of mail-in ballots that have been submitted because of COVID and because how the state laws vary so much, we have to be ready to hear maybe on election night that we don't have an actual distinct answer of who our next president is. And it might not even come on Wednesday. It might be something that it goes out uh, a few days or even a week, um, fingers crossed. So be ready for that and don't be disappointed that you're not hearing it on election night because this counting of the ballots is going to be something that takes some time. Okay, so we're gonna do one last poll. Um, it might sound confusing, but it'll, it'll all be explained. You'll get it in a minute. Um, so the question is, how well are you aware of your political personality? I'll give you a few seconds or a few minutes to answer that. Okay, and if we can see those results. How do I do that? <laughs> okay, well, we're just gonna move forward. Um, can I actually have, oh, actually there it is. We have 31% say that they're very aware. Wow, 45% for the most part. 14% not at all. And then I'm assuming, 
Oh yeah, and then ten percent says, "What the heck is a political personality?" Um, I figured some people would have questions about that, so I'm going to actually ask um, our moderators to drop a link in the chat. Um, it is for our political personality, and if everybody can go ahead and click on that link, we are going to give you about three minutes to take this quick little quiz. Um, it says it should only take about one minute, but we're going to give you three minutes just in case. Um, go through, answer it as honestly as possible. Um, and then once you're done with that, you should have an entire profile uh, that lists your political personality. Um, and as you can see on the screen, there are a couple of, quite a few of them. There's eight of them. So after you do that, I'll go ahead and explain what all of them are. Um, so you can go ahead and get started on that now if you'd like. Seeing some great personalities in the chat. If you're still taking it, no worries. Um, I see a lot of social guardians. What else? We have the utopian, I don't even know how to pronounce that, virtu, vir, virtuoso. Um, we have the justice warrior. Great. So continue to take it if you still are, no worries. Um, and you can still drop your answer in the chat. I see tons coming in. So thank you guys for that. I'm gonna go over them just to kind of explain what they are. It's right here on the screen, but I'll go ahead and read it aloud for you guys. So we have the one that I can't pronounce, Utopian <laughs> Virtuoso. Um, these people strive for perfection and they have an inborn sense of idealism and morality. So if you got that one, that's what you are. Um, and you'll be able to see your entire um, profile as well. So feel free to read through it. It's very, very detailed. Um, and we have the social guardian, which I see quite a few of you have. Uh, social guardians believe in the good of others and passively guard social order and rights. And then we have the ast astute logician. Wow. Grounded in reality and are known for their unique perspectives and vigorous intellect. And then we have the stal stalwart, guys, bear with me. Nationalist <laughs> project confidence. Uh, project confidence, charisma, and authority to achieve the political ends they've set for themselves. Then we have justice warrior. Justice warriors are natural born leaders who are unafraid to stand up for the people and ideas they believe in. Then we have the freedom steward, um, autonomous individuals who value personal freedom and choice above all else. 
Then we have our growth capitalist. These are savvy champions of economic growth with a keen sense for maximizing wealth. And then lastly, we have our civic observer. Um, these people are open and practically minded citizens who generally stay out of the political spotlight. So that is the political personality. Um, like I said, there's a very detailed profile, so please take the time to read through it. You don't have to do it now, but after this meeting, take the time to read through it, really understand what it's saying. Um, there's also some really helpful resources on there. Um, so this is just a fun little quiz and you can share with your friends and family so they can also find out what their political personality is. So with that, I'm actually going to let's see what we're on. We have a few minutes. Um, do we want to open for questions or do we, are we going to close? I actually have a quick announcement. So for those who did not fill out the RSVP and joined us, I'm going to link a quick uh, survey so that you are still eligible. Oh, I can't speak either. Eligible <laughs> to obtain your pizza coupon. So watch out for the chat. Yes, if you want your pizza coupon, make sure to find that and fill it out ASAP. Because that's one of the best parts of this entire event, right? Everybody just came for the pizza. No, we love the politics too. Um, okay, so we are going to open for questions for a few minutes. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, or you can, I think there's a raise hand feature. You can use that. Or you could just use the chat box or the Q&A. So please feel free to ask any questions and we will have our lovely professors answer those for you. I have a, an announcement. I'm going to be posting a nonpartisan candidate guide for anyone who's interested and or confused about our current candidates. It's a good way to get yourself educated. It's nonpartisan, therefore non-biased. Katie had a question earlier. Katie, do you remember your question? Okay, Angel has a question as well. Yes, I do. Uh, my question is specifically, you guys were mentioning about uh, the electoral vote and how there's actual people that actually go out and vote for the person when, when we all vote and stuff. How is it possible for them to know that the, flo uh, the, the Florida wants, uh, let's say, I don't know, Donald Trump wants Biden specifically, and they go out and vote for the other person no matter what? Is that possible for them to do that? It's, uh, yeah, yes and no. It's, I mean, it's possible. The, the Constitution doesn't put a limit on them, right? But there was a Supreme Court case that said that states can enforce, this was just over the summer, that states can enforce laws that prohibit the electors from doing something that they're from voting in a different way than what they're told. Now that can be a fine. Um, it can be that they will remove that vote. So it, you know, I mean, it, it, anything is possible, but there are rules in place that stop it from happening. And like, like we said, right. The, you know, these are people who are committed to the party. If these, let's say Joe Biden wins and the electors say, you know what, the Democratic Party picked us, but to, to represent these voters, but we're gonna vote for Donald Trump instead. What do you think the voters in Florida would do? Definitely go ahead and riot. Cause like, I mean, that's <laughs> wrong. That didn't, that didn't actually happen. Exactly. Huh. That's, so remember we're a check on government too. So they would have to contend with some seriously upset voters if they went and did that. And the, the, you know, they're, they're just, it can happen, but it's one of those things, you know, could I win the lottery? I could, um, probably won't, <laughs> I could. Typically, Angel, to your question, typically what happens is that, you know, those Democrats that are pledged to Joe Biden, what may happen, and this is what happened during, for Clinton, is some of them in their states, Clinton won their state, they were supposed to go cast their votes for Clinton, but some of them were major Bernie supporters, Bernie Sanders. So they were, that was the idea that there should have been, it's not the idea that they liked the opposing candidate uh, from the other party, it's that they thought someone should have been the main candidate 
for their party. So instead of it being Joe Biden, they think Pete Buttigieg or they think uh, Bernie Sanders should have been that person. That's where the bigger issues are arising. Thank you for answering my question. I really appreciate it. Okay, I'm not a fan of the system, I, but it, you know, we're kind of stuck with it and it works for the most part. <laughs> Pam, we have a quick question. Do you think they've learned their lesson? The faithless, the, the electors that didn't vote the way they were supposed to? Um, I'm assuming. Yes, yeah. Um, well, it depends on if they felt there was an elector in Texas who in 2016 voted for John Kasich instead of Donald Trump because of moral conflicts with voting for Trump. And this didn't make a difference in the election. And it probably was enough that, you know, they, they were able to feel good about the choice that they made. So I don't know um, about learning the lesson. I guess it's kind of that they were, you know, they got to make their voice heard and it didn't harm the outcome of the election. I did see another question about uh, prepaying taxes. Um, and I'm, I'm not familiar with what that comment was in the debate. So we're probably gonna skip that just so you know that we did see it in the chat, but I'm not sure. It's gonna make me go back to the debate transcript <laughs> to see what it was regarding prepaying taxes that I overlooked. I see Jade has a hand up or is that, was that a type? Um, I think Julian answered. I gotcha. Okay. Okay. All right. So sorry. Never mind. Okay. So I guess this is the time to close. And if we can go to the last slide. Should be a quote on. Okay. So I have a quote to leave you all with. It says, our lives begin the day, end the day we become silent about the things that matter from MLK. And I leave you with this. I highly, highly recommend and vehemently urge you all to vote and use your voice. Wherever you lean politically, voting will always matter and always be essential. Uh, we encourage you all on the panel to use your voice and stand for what you believe is right and just as whoever wins on your ballot will determine the next years to come. And also leaving you with this, early voting ends on November 1st, this Sunday. And if you wanna, um, if you want to vote on election day, make sure you have a plan. And the last day to vote is on November 3rd. So on behalf of me and Trinity, we wanna thank Professor Heather Ramsire and Adrian Matthews for the work they've done for this town hall and agreeing to give you all the information you need on voting. And election day is on November 3rd, yes, sir. And SGA for their help and participation, everyone who was moderating and answering the questions in the chat. And again, make sure you have a plan to vote. And yep, that's all. And there's the quote if you wanna see. Thank you all so much for coming. Please make sure that you uh, clicked on that survey if you haven't already. But thank you guys. And yes, thank you, uh, Professor Ramsey and Professor Matthews so, so much for answering questions and going through that awesome presentation. Thank you all, this was wonderful. Bye everybody, have a good night. Thank you everyone from student government, you guys did a great job. Thank you guys. Uh, uh, Keith, we can